Hi everybody and welcome to lesson 11 of the Ignis Petrology series. In this lesson I'm going to be talking about Bowen's reaction series. So this is a reaction series created by Norman Bowen in the early 1900s. It's essentially a way of organising minerals in igneous systems by the temperature at which they crystallise. High temperature at the top, low temperature at the bottom. Compatible minerals will grow, while incompatible minerals will resorb. The reaction series has two sides. It has a continuous series, which is the right side of the reaction series, which essentially includes the solid solution evolution of high calcium plagioclase, a northite, to high sodium plagioclase, which is albite. Albite being low temperature and northite being high temperature. On the left hand side of the reaction series, we have what's known as the discontinuous series, which includes ferromagnesium minerals of olivine, pyroxene, amphibole, and biotite. As temperature cools from high temperature olivine to low temperature biotite, the minerals will undergo incongruent reactions where pyroxene will crystallize at the expense of olivine, amphibole at the expense of pyroxene, and biotite at the expense of amphibole. We're going to see that. So here's a really simplified example of Bowen's phase diagram. We have temperature decreasing on the left hand side. We have our discontinuous series of olivine, pyroxene, amphibole, biotite, and our continuous series of calcium rich plagioclase and northite to sodium rich plagioclase, albite. And as the system becomes really felsic, we start crystallizing things like K feldspar, muscovite, and quartz. Now, they're not truly in the, in the discontinuous series because they don't host either iron or magnesium. And they're also not plagioclase feldspars. So they're their own thing. If we look at it from a compositional perspective, we can break it down where we have high magnesium, iron, and calcium at the top. And then we have high silica, sodium, potassium, phosphorus, and other incompatible elements at the bottom. Let's take a look at the discontinuous series because the continuous series is fairly self-explanatory since we've looked at solid solution phase diagrams in previous lessons. What the discontinuous series really represents is crystal structure and silica activity. So silica typically takes the form of tetrahedra SiO4- and that forms the foundation of these particular silicates. Okay, So olivine is what's known as an orthosilicate where it comprises isolated silica tetrahedra, which is bound by metal cations, magnesium and iron. As the system decreases from high to low temperature, the amount of silica increases whilst the amount of magnesium and iron decreases. So we start to increase silica activity as the system cools. That will eventually lead to pyroxene crystallizing at the expense of olivine. If we think back to that peritectic reaction of olivine plus liquid equals enstatite, it's kind of what we're seeing here. And pyroxene represents a chain silicate. So now we have chains of silica tetrahedra bound by metal iron cations, magnesium cations. Again, the same thing will happen with alphabol replacing pyroxene. Amphibols are double chain silicates. So now we have more silica, less metal cations. And then finally biotite, which is a sheet silicate, where we have silica tetrahedra in the sheets bound by metal cations for biotite, magnesium, and iron. So now let's take a look at it again, but let's look at it from the perspective of the rock rather than the geochemistry. So what we're essentially seeing is an evolution from ultramafic to felsic via mafic and intermediate rocks. So what that means is at the top, if we consider intrusive and extrusive rocks, intrusive being rocks that haven't been emplaced at the surface, but rather somewhere in the crust, and extrusive rocks being lavas that have erupted onto the surface. Now we typically classify rocks via this relationship or via their grain size because those that have been emplaced inside the crust typically have a larger grain size because they've taken longer to cool whereas those emplaced over the crust generally have a finer grain size because they've taken longer to cool. So examples of intrusive ultramafic rocks would be peridotite, we can break that down further into whirlite, websterite, dunites, lertilites, and the extrusive equivalent of those rocks would be things like comartiites or picrites, high magnesium, very ultramafic rocks. Then we might go to mafic rocks, so mafic intrusive rocks would be things like gabbros, gabbronorites, norites and peroxonites, and the extrusive equivalent would be high magnesium basalts or basalts. Intermediate, we'd have things like diorites as an intrusive rock, or andesites as an extrusive rock. 
we continue to falsify the system, we would get an intrusive granite diorite, which sits between a diorite and a granite, hence its name, or an extrusive equivalent would be a dacite. And then finally, our most felsic intrusive rock is a granite, because it has loads of that K feldspar muscovite in quartz. And then we have an extrusive equivalent, rhyolite, which is essentially a very, very fine-grained granite. I hope you found this introduction to Bowen's reaction series helpful. Stay in the loop by clicking subscribe. Thank you for listening.